Hi folks, I'm Marina Namchu and welcome back to Prep Up with Marina. Today, without wasting any time, we will begin the chapter The Chinese Statue by Jeffrey Archer. So here we go. The little Chinese statue was the next item to come under the auctioneer's hammer. All right, the meaning of auctioneer is a person who conducts auctions by accepting bids and, uh, you know, um, declaring goods sold. Lot 103 caused those quiet murmurings that always precede the sale of a masterpiece. Those quiet murmurings means the indistinct continuous sound which could be heard in the auction room. The auctioneer's assistant held up the delicate piece of ivory for the packed audience to admire while the auctioneer glanced around the room to be sure he knew where the serious bidders were seated. All right. Uh, the meaning of uh, bidders means, you know, a person or a group of people who offer to pay uh, an amount to buy that particular piece which is being sold. I studied my catalogue and read the detailed description of the piece and what was known of its history. And the meaning of catalogue means a complete list of items. The statue had been purchased in Hali Chua in 1871 and was referred to as what Sotheby's quaintly described as the property of a gentleman. All right, now let's go back to what Sotheby's is. Now, um, the Sotheby's is actually a British multinational corporation that is one of the largest brokers of fine and decorative art, jewelry, uh, real estate and other uh, collectibles. Quaintly means uh, very unusual or very old, usually meaning that some member of the aristocracy did not wish to admit that he was having to sell off one of the family heirlooms. Now family heirlooms means a valuable object that actually belonged to the family for several generations. I wondered if that was the case on this occasion and decided to do some research to, to discover what had caused the little Chinese statue to find its way into the auction rooms on that Thursday morning over 100 years later. So now this is being, uh, you know, uh, told about the author. Uh, the author, he wonders why and how that Chinese statue actually came to be, <clears throat> sorry, in the auction room on that Thursday morning. Lot number 103 declared the auctioneer. What am I bid for this magnificent example of Sir Alexander Heathcote? He was the British ambassador, all right? Sir Alexander Heathcote, as well as being a gentleman, was an exact man. An exact man means a person who is very precise, who is very particular about things. He was exactly six foot three and a quarter inches tall, rose at seven o'clock every morning, joined his wife at breakfast to eat one boiled egg, cooked for precisely four minutes, two pieces of toast with one spoonful of Cooper's marmalade and drink one cup of China tea. So we can see here, we are told about Alexander Heathcote, how particular he was, what time he rose, how he appeared to be what he ate for breakfast every day. All right, he was a very precise person. He would then take a hackney carriage. Now, what is a hackney carriage? A hackney carriage is a carriage which is pulled by horses and it's used as a taxi. 
So he would then take a hackney carriage from his home in Cardigan Gardens at exactly 20, sorry, 8.20 and arrive at foreign ex office at promptly 8.59, returning home again on the stroke of 6 o'clock. So he was never too early nor too late. He was exact on time while going to um, his workplace and while coming back home. And his mode of transport was the hackney carriage which he used. Sir Alexander had been exact from an early age as became the, as became the only son of a general. So Sir Alexander we are told here uh, he was a very particular person uh, as he was the son of the only son of a, a general. But unlike his father he chose to serve his queen in the diplomatic service, another exacting calling. Another exacting calling means a calling which demands a lot of effort and care uh, about certain details. He progressed from a shared desk at the foreign office in Whitehall to third secretary in Calcutta, to second secretary in Vienna, to first secretary in Rome, to deputy ambassador in Washington, and finally, to minister in Peking. So we can we see here that he held various posts in different places around the world. And finally, he was here now in Peking, that is in China. He was delighted when Mr. Gladstone invited him to represent the government in China, as he had for some considerable time taken more than an amateur interest in the art of the Ming dynasty. So. Uh, we, we are told here uh, that uh, Sir Alexander Heathcote, he was a very keen admirer of the, Ming, uh, the art of the Ming dynasty. And so he was very uh, happy to be, you know, transferred or posted to China. This crowning, crowning means supreme, appointment in his distinguished career would afford him what until then he would have considered impossible an opportunity to observe in their natural habitat some of the great statues, paintings and drawings which he had previously been able to admire only in books. So uh, as uh, we have already talked about it, Sir Alexander Heathcote being a lover of art was extremely excited when he came to know that he was being posted to uh, Peking in China because he always used to admire the art of the Ming Dynasty only in books so far. But now that he was getting a chance to go into the country itself, he was very excited. When Sir Alexander arrived in Peking after a journey by sea and land that took his party nearly two months, so it took them two months to reach, he presented his seals patent to the Empress Susi and a personal letter for a private reading from Queen Victoria. <clears throat> Sorry. So here it said, he presented his seals a patent. Now, what is patent? Seals which are patent. Okay, now patent actually means a declaration which is issued by a government uh, to an inventor and having the privilege of stopping others from making, using or selling the claimed invention. All right, so he presented it to Empress Susi and also a personal letter uh, which he was carrying for the Empress from Queen Victoria. The Empress, dressed from head to toe in white and gold, received her new ambassador in the throne room of the Imperial Palace. She read the letter from the British monarch while Sir Alexander remained standing to attention. Her Imperial Highness revealed nothing of its contents and to the new minister, sorry, nothing of its contents to the new minister, only wishing him a successful term of office in his appointment. So whatever Queen Victoria had written to the Empress, Alexander uh, Heathcote would never come to know about it because um, the Empress never gave away its contents, the contents of the letter. She then moved her lips slightly up at the corners, which Sir Alexander judged correctly to mean 
that the audience had come to an end. The audience, audience means uh, the formal meeting had come to an end. As he was conducted back through the great halls of the imperial palace by a mandarin. Now, who is a mandarin? A mandarin actually is a bureaucrat in ancient China. Now here, Mandarin means an interpreter and a guide. So, he was um, conducted back through the great halls of the imperial palace by a Mandarin in the long court dress of black and gold. Sir Alexander walked sl as slowly as possible, taking in the magnificent collection of ivory and jade statues which were scattered casually around the building, much in the way Selene and Michelangelo today lie stacked against each other in Florence. Florence is in the province of Tuscany in Italy. So, you know, as he was walking away after he, uh, after he had finished, uh, you know, meeting uh, the empress, he was walking down the corridor and he was looking around, admiring the beautiful statues, you know, the statues made of ivory and jade, which were just ca casually lying here and there. As his ministerial appointment, ministerial means, uh, you know, the governmental, uh, as a governmental minister. As his ministerial appointment was for only three years, Sir Alexander took no leave. So he did not take any breaks at all, but preferred to use his time to put the embassy behind him and travel on horseback into the outlying districts to learn more about the country and its people. So, you know, whenever he had the free time, he never ever, uh, you know, wasted it. In fact, he went around in the countryside, just visiting the places in uh, Peking. On these trips, he was always accompanied by a Mandarin from the palace staff who acted as interpreter and guide. On one such journey, passing through the muddy streets of a small village with but a few houses called Halichua, a distance of some 50 miles from Peking, Sir Alexander chanced upon an old craftsman's working place. So one day, like usual, he was, you know, um, moving around the place. He came upon a house right a house of a craftsman leaving his servants the minister dismounted dismounted he got up from the horse um, he dismounted from his horse and entered the ramshackle wooden workshop to admire the delicate pieces pieces of ivory and jade that crammed the shelves from floor to ceiling ramshackle means the hut, you know, which was in a very bad condition. All right. So he got down from the horse and he entered uh, this, uh, uh, you know, hut, which was in a very poor condition to admire the beautiful pieces of art. Although modern, the pieces were superbly executed by an experienced craftsman and the minister entered the little hut with the thought of acquiring a small memento. Memento means a souvenir or a keepsake. Uh, of his journey so you know he actually got off uh, got off from the horse uh, thinking that he would just take a small piece of uh, you know uh, souvenir back home from this craftsman once in the shop he could hardly move in any direction for fear of knocking something over because you know the shop was so cramped with uh, the different uh, you know um, objects the different pieces of statues which were lying there. The building had not been designed for a six foot three and a quarter visitor uh, because basically uh, the people, uh, the Asian people are much, uh, you know, shorter uh, physically. Uh, they are smaller in size than um, the people from Europe. So this hut was very small. So, you know, uh, Sir Alexander Heathcote, he, he had to literally bend his head in order to enter the hut. Sir Alexander stood still and enthralled. Enthralled means he was totally charmed, charmed, taking in the fine scented jasmine smell that hung in the air. An old craftsman bustled forward. Bustled means he was like uh, very excited, you know, and uh, full of activity. Uh, 
uh, he, uh, he moved forward in a long blue coolie robe. Coolie. Now coolie means it's actually it's a it's a robe which is worn by unskilled Asian workers. All right. So this man, uh, this Chinese man, he was wearing a blue coolie robe and flat black hat to greet him. A jet black plated pigtail fell back, fell down his back. He bowed very low and then looked up at the giant from England. The minister returned the bow while the Mandarin explained who Sir Alexander was and his desire to be allowed to look at the work of the craftsman. The old man was nodding his agreement even before the Mandarin had come to the end of his request. For over an hour, the minister sighed and chuckled. Chuckled means to laugh very quietly, okay? Um, as a mark of satisfaction. He chuckled as he studied many of the pieces with admiration and finally returned to the old man to praise his skill. The craftsman bowed once again and a shy smile revealed no teeth but only genuine pleasure at Sir Alexander's compliments. Pointing a finger to the back of the shop, he beckoned the two important visitors to follow him. Beckon means to kind of give a signal, you know, like uh, with your finger or your hand, like calling someone. They did so and entered a veritable, veritable means, you know, very uh, truly uh, Aladdin's cave. So they entered a place which looked like Aladdin's cave with row upon row of beautiful miniature emperors and classical figures. The minister could have happily settled down in the augie of ivory for at least a week. All right. Now, augie means a huge amount of something. Okay. He could have just settled down there and kind of really enjoyed himself admiring these pieces of art. So Alexander and the craftsman chatted, chat, sorry, chatted away to each other through the interpreter. And the minister's love and knowledge of the Ming dynasty was soon revealed. The little craftsman's face lit up with this discovery and he turned to the Mandarin and in a hushed voice made a request. The Mandarin nodded his agreement and translated. I have, Your Excellency, a piece of Ming myself that you might care to see, a statue that has been in my family for over seven generations. So, you know, the craftsman, he said this in his own uh, tongue to the Mandarin and uh, here because he wanted Sir Alexander Heathcote to see the piece of art which he had uh, with him for seven uh, generations in their family. I should be honored, said the minister. It is I who would be honored, Your Excellency, said the little man, who thereupon scampered, scampered means to move with short, quick steps, who scampered out of the back door, nearly falling over a stray dog and on to an old peasant house a few yards behind the workshop. The minister and the Mandarin remained in the back room. For Sir Alexander knew, the old man would never have considered inviting an honored guest into his humble home until they had known each other for many years. And only then, after he had been invited to Sir Alexander's home first. A few minutes passed before the little blue figure came trotting back, pigtail bouncing up and down on his shoulders. So uh, the craftsman, he went into his uh, peasant-like house and then he came back with something in his hand. He was now clinging on to something that from the very way he held it close to his chest had to be a treasure. So whatever it was that he was holding, he was holding it very dearly, you know, uh, to his chest, very closely to his chest, which showed that it was something very precious to him. The craftsman passed the piece over for the minister to study. So he gave it over to Sir Alexander Heathcote. Sir Alexander's mouth opened wide and he could not hide his excitement. The little statue, no more than six inches in height, was of the Emperor Kung and as fine an example of Ming as the minister had seen. Sir Alexander felt confident that the maker was the great Pen Q who had been patronized by the Emperor so that the date 
must have been around the turn of the 15th century. The statue's only blemish, only flaw, only drawback was that the ivory base on which such pieces usually rest was missing. And a small stick protruded, protruded means it jutted out from the bottom of the imperial robes. So the craftsman came back with a piece of art. It was the statue of the emperor, Kung, and uh, which Alexander Heathcote, he immediately knew that it was uh, the work of uh, the great uh, uh, Pen Q, who had been patronized by the emperor. So, but uh, this, um, the only drawback that the statue had was that the base of the statue was missing. The ivory base was missing and there was a stick instead which was jutting out uh, from, uh, you know, from the bottom of the robes. But in the eyes of Sir Alexander, nothing could detract. Detract means take away from its overall beauty. Although the craftsman's lips did not move, his eyes glowed. Glowed means it shone. With the pleasure his guest evinced, evinced means made evident as he studied the em ivory emperor. You think the statue is good? Asked the craftsman through the in interpreter. It's magnificent. That means it's beautiful, it's attractive, impressive. The minister replied, quite magnificent. My own work is not worthy to stand by its side, added the craftsman humbly. No, no, said the minister. Though in truth, the little craftsman knew the great man was only being kind, for Sir Alexander was holding the ivory statue in a way that already showed the very love as the old man had for the piece. So, you know, the craftsman immediately, he came to know that Sir Alexander was a person who really loved art and sculpture. The minister smiled down at the craftsman as he handed back the Emperor Kung and then he uttered perhaps the only undiplomatic words he had ever spoken in 35 years of serving his queen and country. All right, now what did he say? What was that undiplomatic, uh, you know, those undiplomatic words? Undiplomatic means, you know, uh, where you do not use your tact where you are insensitive, okay? So let's see, what did he say? He said, how I wish the peace was mine. Sir Alexander regretted voicing his thoughts immediately, voicing, saying whatever he had said immediately. He heard the Mandarin translate them. So the, as soon as he said this, you know, how I wish the peace was mine, the Mandarin immediately, he translated it to the craftsman. Because he knew only too well the old Chinese tradition that if an honored guest requests something, the giver will grow in the eyes of his fellow men by parting with it. So, you know, Sir Alexander knew that he had made a mistake when he said, I wish, you know, um, the peace was mine. Because he knew immediately that the craftsman would part with uh, that piece of art, as it was a Chinese tradition. A sad look came over the face of the little old craftsman as he handed back the figurine to the minister. No, no, I, I, I was only joking, said Sir Alexander, quickly trying to return the piece to its owner. You would dishonor my humble home if you did not take the emperor, your excellency, the old man said anxiously, and the Mandarin gravely nodded his agreement. The minister remained silent for some time. I have dishonored my own home, sir, he replied, and looked towards the Mandarin, who remained inscrutable. Inscrutable means, um, you know, um, impossible to understand or interpret. The little craftsman bowed. I must fix a base on the statue, he said, or you will not be able to put the piece on view. He went to a corner of the room and opened a wooden packing chest that must have housed a hundred bases for his own statues. Rummaging, rummaging means searching, you know, unsystematically, untidily. Rummaging around, he picked out a base decorated with small dark figures that the minister did not care for, but which nevertheless made a perfect fit. So since, you know, we already talked about it, the statue did not have a base. Uh, the craftsman, he went back 
he hunted for one and he came uh, all right the old man assured sir alexander that although he did not know the basis story the piece bore the mark of a good craftsman so you know he had a base uh, he already had a base uh, so he did not know its history the history about the base but he said that it was made by a good craftsman the embarrassed minister took the gift and tried hopelessly to thank the little old man the craftsman once again bowed low as sir alexander and the expressionless mandarin left the little workshop as the party traveled back to peking the mandarin observed the terrible state the minister was in and uncharacteristically spoke first your excellency is no doubt aware he said of the old chinese custom that when a stranger has been generous you must return the kindness within the calendar year so you know it was a tradition in china that uh, you know if somebody gifted you uh, with something then you had to return uh, you know by gifting him uh, something else within the calendar year that means within that same year so this the mandarin reminds sir alexander heathcote sir alexander smiled his thanks and thought carefully about the mandarin's words once back in his official residence he went immediately to the embassy embassy's extensive library to see if he could discover a realistic value for the little masterpiece after much diligent research after you know thorough research he came across a drawing of a ming statue that was almost an exact copy of the one now in his possession and with the help of the mandarin he was able to assess its true worth a figure that came to almost 3 years emolument for a servant of the crown emolument means uh, you know the money which is paid to somebody for the work he has done the minister discussed the problem with lady hithcourt and she left her husband in no doubt as to the course of action he must take <clears throat> the following week the minister dispatched a letter by private messenger to his bankers coots and company in the strand london requesting that they send a large part of his savings to reach him in peking as quickly as possible when the funds arrived 9 week, weeks later the minister again approached the mandarin who listened to his questions and gave him the details he had asked for 7 days later All right boys and girls I am going to stop here uh today because it's a very long chapter as you know so uh this um this chap uh, this lesson is going to have two videos so I would request you all to stay tuned for uh, the part 2 video which will be following very soon so with that bye bye